Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Luke and I do perfume reviews. This is part two of my 100 years of fragrance video. It covers the four remaining decades that haven't been covered in part one. So in this video, we'll explore general trends, iconic scents, and my personal favorites from the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s. So let's start with the 80s. The olfactory trends of the 80s were, much like everything else in the 80s, very extravagant, excessive and diverse. Often referred to as the decade of greed and excess, the 80s witnessed the launch of remarkable fragrances that reshaped the course of perfume history, introducing new trends and fragrances that are considered timeless classics today. Personally, the 80s is one of my favourite decades in perfumery, although to be fair, it's a close tie with the 90s. I like the 80s and the 90s equally. I love perfumes from both decades and I have many of them in my collection. No fragrance epitomises the 80s quite like Poison from Dior, which is a potent, seductive and gothic tuberose fragrance that brought something entirely new and never seen before to the market. Dior truly surpassed expectations with the launch of Poison. Poison is an intoxicating blend of sweetness, smokiness, intense florals and a hint of spice and fruitiness. I own a vintage eau de toilette from the late 80s or the early 90s, I'm not entirely sure. And I have to say, while the new version isn't bad, I much prefer the vintage. Poison has had a special place in my collection for many years. It's one of my absolute favourites. Another scent that symbolises the excess of the 80s is Giorgio Beverly Hills. It's a bold and distinctive tuberose scent. Another beautiful floral is Isatis de Givenchy, released in 1984. It's one of my personal favourites. It's a honeyed white and yellow floral with an almost tropical quality. And despite having a woody, ambery and animalic base, it's got a lot of added sweetness, which is very typical of 80s perfumery. Another gem, unfortunately discontinued but reminiscent of Isatis, is Byzance from the House of Rochas. The oriental trend remained popular in the 80s. Calvin Klein released Obsession in 1985 and it's a spicy oriental, one year before, Chanel released its first spicy oriental fragrance, Coco, also one of my absolute favourites. It's still a spicy oriental, but it also features floral and fruity notes, which make it sweet and distinctly 80s in style. It feels like an 80s fragrance, even though it's an oriental. Another scent that was released in the 70s, but came to define the 80s, was opium from Yves Saint Laurent. And of course, in 1988, Guerlain released Samsara, one of the first predominantly woody fragrances for women. With a lasting impact, Samsara really reshaped perfume trends in the 80s, making woody fragrances for women something completely normal. And we also mustn't forget about celebrity scents. While Elizabeth Taylor launched Passion in the late 80s, Joan Collins, also known as Alexis Carrington from Dynasty, had her own scent called Spectacular. So let's move on to the 90s. The 90s was an eclectic and dynamic decade. Many new fragrance trends were born, ranging from fresh, aquatic and minimalistic scents to heavy florals. Other genres were also popular, fruity florals, aquatic scents, classic florals, futuristic scents, soft orientals, vanilla fragrances, and even early gourmands. And I'll try to discuss one from each category. From the fresh, aquatic and ozonic scents, Calvin Klein Escape and Lord Dizzy from Izzy Miyake were very popular back in the 90s. Notes like lotus, lily, musk and melon became quite popular in such compositions. Dior released their own 90s fragrance 
and they wanted to release something modern and groundbreaking and unusual, so they went for a fresh, light and breezy scent that evokes sand dunes and sea breeze. And I'm talking about Dior Dune from 1991, and I just adore this fragrance. It's a fresh amber fragrance. It's very mysterious and very hard to describe. I have a full review on my channel, should you wish to check it out. Fruity florals with the note of peach were also very popular. In 1990, Longcom released Trésor, then Chopard released Casimir in 1992, and Yves Saint Laurent released Champagne, or Ivresse, in 1993, as well as Venezia from Laura Biagiotti in 1992, and finally we've got a soft, fruity, spicy oriental from 1994, Dolce Vita from Dior, one of my absolute favourites. It's a sweet, peachy, woody scent that, along with Feminité du Bois from Shiseido and Samsara from Guerlain, really popularised woody scents for women. The next category are futuristic scents, like the fresh, peppery violet scent called Paco Rabanne Ultraviolet, housed in this stunning avant-garde bottle, as well as Gucci Rush, housed it in an even more futuristic bottle. Gucci Rush is a fruity floral patchouli scent and it's one of my favourites. Another fragrance that really defined the decade and introduced the concept of unisex fragrances was Calvin Klein One or CK One, a fresh and minimalist fragrance designed to be worn by anyone. In 1992, the world's first modern gourmand fragrance was created Angel by Thierry Mugler. It's a potent chocolate patchouli scent that revolutionised the perfume history and triggered a sort of domino effect. Many new gourmand fragrances were released after Angel. Another category of fragrances that was really popular back in the 90s were vanilla scents. Vanilla had already been a common note in many fragrances, but not in large quantities, in 1990, Alyssa Ashley released a pure, almost gourmand vanilla scent called Vanilla. In 1992, Chopard released Casimir, an oriental vanilla scent. And in 1998, Dior released Hypnotic Poison, an almond vanilla scent, considered one of the first gourmands and also one of my personal favourites. I've been using Hypnotic Poison for years and years and it's just one of the most beautiful vanilla scents and it was very influential when it came out because it really popularized this gourmand vanilla accord and perfumers began using it in many other fragrances. Opulent florals are really the scents that best defined the 90s in my opinion. I have quite a few of them in my collection we mustn't forget about the grand 90s floral scents such as Givenchy and Marige, a stunning white and yellow floral scent with a hint of peach released in 1990. And then in 1993, Jean-Paul Gaultier released their first fragrance called Classique. It's an opulent floral vanilla scent. And in 1995, Longcom released their version of a 90s floral called Poem. It's based on mimosa and tuberose, and it has a lot of added vanilla for sweetness. I used to own Poem, I used it up, and I really want to get another bottle of it when I see it for a good price. Another fragrance from 1995 was Rare Gold from Avon, and this is also a 90s floral, but it's affordable. But it does smell like a cheaper version of Amarige or Poem. It's along those lines, but it's definitely not an expensive smelling designer fragrance like Amarige and Poem. We also have to keep in mind that during the 90s, most powerhouse florals from the 80s, such as Lulu, Poison or Boucheron, were still very much worn by lots of people. So the 80s fragrances were worn well into the 90s, especially the ones released in the late 80s, like 
Lulu from Cacherelle. Let's move on to the 2000s. The 2000s was an era of modern pop music with superstars like Britney Spears. Perfumes have changed quite a lot compared to the 90s. The fresh trend from the 90s continued, but there are also many other new scent categories. In 1999, Elizabeth Arden released Green Tea, which is a fresh green tea scent that remains popular today. And I think the scent really defined the early 2000s. Another perfume genre that was truly groundbreaking and really defined the early 2000s were the fruity patchouli scents. We see many modern and sweet fruity floral patchouli scents. In 2001, Chanel released Coco Mademoiselle, which was at the time like a breath of fresh air. It was a fruity patchouli scent that stayed sophisticated and classic. It was all the rage back then. I remember smelling it everywhere for years to come. I think it was one of the most influential fragrances from the 2000s, and it's still one of the best sellers. Another scent that came out in 1999, but defined the 2000s, was Dior J'adore. And I have a sample here because I don't really like J'adore. I like some of the flankers, but I don't like the original. It's just too fresh and shampooy. But it was a very influential fragrance, and I can still see those those ads with Charlize Theron, who's been the face of J'adore for years and years. A few other scents that really defined the era include Alien from Thierry Mugler, Clinique Happy, and of course, a bunch of celebrity fragrances from Britney Spears, J-Lo, and so on. The gourmand trend was also very popular back in the 2000s. We had fragrances with notes of caramel, kiwi, chocolate, cupcakes, and so on. For example, Aquilina Pink Sugar, Juicy Couture, Viva La Juicy, and several fragrances from Victoria's Secret and Body Mists. And these fragrances really just paired perfectly with that signature Y2K look defined by Paris Hilton, who used to wear um, pink velvet tracksuits from Juicy Couture. And keep in mind that I live in Europe, where people are just not, are not crazy about American celebrities. But Paris Hilton and Britney Spears were everywhere back then. I've got two more fragrances from the 2000s. The first one is Dior Addict from 2002. It's a classic vanilla that has become incredibly popular. And we also have Sensuous from Estee Lauder from 2008. And I consider these fragrances sweet, but still classic, not gourmand. Another one that I'll just briefly mention, because I'm not a fan of it anymore, is Pure Poison by Dior. I absolutely love this. I think it's from 2005. I absolutely love this scent, but the performance is just horrible on me. The new version does not perform on me at all. Moving on to the 2010s. There were so many old and new perfume trends and genres that it's really hard to categorise them, but two that stand out the most are sweet gourmands and sweet syrupy florals. The 2010s were all about sweet gourmands and sweet florals. In order to become mass appealing, fragrances had to become sugar bombs. The sweeter, the better. We all know about Gucci Guilty, Prada Candy, Jimmy Choo, Longcom Trésor Midnight Rose, Longcom La Via Belle, Dolce Gabbana Pour Femme, YSL Manifesto, Armani C, Black Opium, La Nuit Trésor, and a bunch of others that I'll put on the screen because I can't be bothered reading all of these out. I have to say, though, that one of my favourites from the 2010s was Miss Dior, or actually all the different Miss Dior flankers, especially the Miss Dior Cherie from 2011. I used up a bottle of that one. And I also used up a bottle of Miss Dior from, I think, 2012. I'm not entirely sure. But it was one of the one of the previous versions, not the one available at the moment. Another note that became very popular in the late 2010s was lavender. 
Guerlain, Mont Guerlain and YSL Libre are two fragrances that I somewhat enjoyed at one point. I used up Mont Guerlain and I decluttered Libre. During the mid-2010s and late 2010s, perfumes started to be consumed differently than before. After 2015, perfume influencers and reviewers on YouTube began hyping up fragrances like Black Opium, La Via Belle and a bunch of other popular designer scents. But it wasn't until the late 2010s that niche became all the rage. The niche perfume market exploded, introducing many new unique fragrances like Baccarat Rouge, Delina, Side Effect, Lyra, Lancôme Eau de Bouquet that I'm showing you here, the Frederick Mal line of fragrances and so on and so on and so forth. We also had some ultra expensive niche brands like Roger Dove, Fragrance Dubois and Creed that became really popular in the late 2010s. But overall, hundreds if not thousands of new niche and indie brands were established during this time. Consequently, the perfume market and the perfume community are now completely oversaturated. I suppose that's just the way of the world we live in. It's globalised and oversaturated with information. That's why I like to revisit my vintage fragrances and I like to listen to myself, to my preferences, as opposed to trends. So we've finally made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching. You're welcome to watch part one if you haven't already. Drop me a comment down below and let me know which fragrances from these decades are your favourites. Thanks for watching. Bye.